Hello, everyone. Uh, can someone type in chat if they can hear me? I want to check to make sure my audio is working. Perfect. Seems like our audio is working. Uh, I'll give this another 30 seconds or so, um, and we'll get started. I want to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, it'll help lead the discussion. I have my stuff to talk about, and then um, answering questions will also help. And then at the end, we'll also have a question and answer uh, segment. Uh, but today, we're going to be just talking about tournament stacks and adjustments you need to be making on your stack sizes in tournaments. Um, I think it's one of the easier fixes people can make, but it's also one of the bigger mistakes that I think weaker players are making in tournaments right now, not making these adjustments to their ranges based off of stack sizes. So it's uh, one o'clock now. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this question stemmed from, you know, I had a student that asked that made day two of a $300 buying tournament. He had a big stack of 100 big blinds, but there was a lot of short stacks. It was a $300 buy-in, so it's you know a more turbo structure. Structure, and he's asking, you know, what adjustments do I need to be making as stack sizes shrink, or more importantly for him, how stacks vary from player to player. So when I have 100 big blinds, but other players have 25 big blinds, what adjustments should I be making? And I think the most important question is, how are my ranges affected by these stack sizes? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So to start off, we're going to kind of get into the basics, um, hand values and stack depths. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes of this webinar and kind of the most important part to take out of it. And this is kind of the easy, quick adjustments that you need to make um, with stack sizes. So first two bullet points are the kind of the most important generalizations. So as stack sizes decrease, the value of big offsuit cards increase. And as stack sizes increase, the value of suited connectors, um, also small pocket pairs, increase. So there's kind of a inverse a relationship between the two, and it's really important which types of hands you should be playing based off what your stack size is. So at 150 big blinds deep, so this would be you know the first couple hours of a tournament, first few levels of a tournament, you want hands that can make better than one pair. Now. That's a little misleading comment because any two unpaired cards have the same exact chance of making two pair. For example, Ace King has the same exact chance of making two pair as Deuce Three, um, without taking into consideration like card removal and stuff. But the benefit of Ace King is Ace King can make the nut straight. Um, let's look at even another example of a hand like Ten Nine Suited. Ten Nine Suited, yeah, it can make two pair, but it can also make a ton of straights and flushes. So we're really looking at suitedness and connectedness when we're playing 150 big blinds deep. That's the biggest thing you need to take away from this. When we're 50 big blinds deep, you want hands that can make good top pairs. So, for example, let's look at a hand like King Jack Offsuit versus 10-9 Suited. At 150 big blinds deep, 10-9 Suited is an amazing hand because you make a ton of straights. You can make, you know, I don't even know how many combinations of straight is, but the 6-7-8 the eight queen jack and then you can also make flushes versus king queen you can make broadway um, a couple different straights but you can't make any flushes and it makes the playability of the hand much worse but at 50 big blinds king queen on a king eight four board becomes a really really powerful hand and as we get into stack to pot ratios later on we will find out that it's easier to stack off with good top pairs when you're 50 big blinds deep versus when you're 150 big blinds deep, you need a lot better than a good top pair to stack off. So I want to look at these two ranges here on the right that we have. Uh, the top range is going to be kind of a, this is like a middle position opening range at 150 big blinds. Um, as you can see, we're playing all the suited aces, all the suited eights. Um, all these suited connectors, suited one gappers, like nine, seven suited, eight, six suited, seven, five suited, and all pocket pairs. But take a look at the offsuit combos. We're only raising ace king off, ace queen off, king queen off, and ace jack offsuit. So that's only four different types of offsuit hands that we're going to be raising. And that's really important 
when we're playing 150 big blinds deep in uh, middle position. Just take a look at how suited heavy this range is. Um, and it's very suited, pocket pair heavy. And this sets us up really well post-flop at 150 big blinds because we're, we're playing hands that can make flushes, straights, sets, strong two pairs. And so we're not opening a lot of garbage hands, you know, king 10 off, ace 10 off, ace 9 off, etc. Now this bottom range uh, is a 50 big blind range. And we have three different colors here. And I'll point out at the bottom at the end here. So the color in the red are all those same hands in the 150 big blind range. The blue, the blue hands are now hands that we are folding pre-flop at 50 big blinds. So at 50 big blinds, we're no longer raising deuces, threes, fours, five, four suited, six, five suited, seven, six suited, eight, six suited, jack eight, 10, eight suited, and then ace four, ace two suited, the wheel aces and ace seven and ace six suited. The green are now hands that we are raising at 50 big blinds. So ace nine off, ace 10 off, king 10 off, king jack and queen jack. So it looks like we're, we folded like a lot of extra hands. Uh, but we added in all these offsuit combos, and when you look at combos, there's 12 ways to make an offsuit hand and four ways to make a suited hand. So the kind of thing I want to point out is this range is actually almost the same percentage of hands. We've just shifted our range from these smaller suited connectors, smaller pocket pairs, and smaller suited aces to these offsuit Broadway hands like ace 10 off, king 10 off, king jack. So... We took out 70 combos here in blue, 5.3% of hands, so 70 combos, and we added in 60 combos. So we only are raising 0.8% less. So I think this range was like around 19, 20%, and now we're raising 19.2%, somewhere around there. Actually, I guess it's uh, like 23. This is like 24%, and this is 23%. So. We're not really raising much tighter at 50 big blinds than we were at 150. We've just changed the type of hands that we're raising. So that's the really key thing to pick up out of these two charts here is how we've shifted our range from small hands to big hands. So, uh, and this is like a middle position range that we're going to be raising. Um, you know, we don't have time today to go through every position. Um, I kind of picked middle position because it's still, we're opening kind of loose. Uh, but we are also, uh, it's not like a button range where we're going to be opening 40 to 50% of hands. So, uh, just looking through these questions really quick. But so key thing here, see how we've shifted our range from lower suited connectors, lower pairs to these offsuit Broadway hands. Continuing discussing this, um, again, we have the two same charts. They're just now all in red. The top one is the 150 big blind chart from middle position. The bottom one is a 50 big blind chart. So now you can kind of see how that range looks with just the 50% or 50 big blind chart down here. So at 150 to 200 big blinds, hand playability is much more important. Suitedness and connectedness of hands um, is really important, like I talked about in the last slide. Offsuit broadways and ace x become less valuable. So our hands are all our offsuit aces. Basically, we're only opening ace jack off and ace queen off um, in early position. I think you should be you can definitely be folding ace jack offsuit. So there's barely any offsuit hands we're opening. Set value of your pocket pairs uh, increases. We are um, you know we have we're deep enough where we can call three bets with our smaller pocket pairs to try to set mine at shorter stacks. You're not getting the correct. Um, implied odds to call three bets with these smaller pocket pairs. Now I will say a little caveat at 200 big blinds, you know, with these deuces, threes and fours, you need to be a little careful because you're setting yourself a tiny bit to be set over set. So be wary of that. Um, and the most important thing, strong top pairs cannot stack off. For example, if you have ace king or ace queen and the flop comes ace seven, three, and then the turn is a flush, like basically with that one pair, if you're playing a 400 big blind pot or a 300 big blind pot, you're probably not going to be good with one pair or you shouldn't be good. At 100 big blinds, this is kind of the middle ground. Your suited connectors and pairs still have some value. 
the big offsuit combos like ace jack and ace queen um, become a little bit more valuable with the the, the stack to pot ratio is going to be a little smaller. Strong pot, stop top pairs can start to play for stacks, especially in three bet pots. And your three better range is more blocker oriented, but still wants playability. We're going to talk about three betting adjustments here in the next slide. Um, hands like ace jack and ace queen here, what I'm talking about. Um, these come very valuable in three bet pots because once you three bet, the pot's going to start to get a little bit bloated. So playing a three bet pot at 100 big blinds is kind of like playing a single raised pot at 50 big blinds, if that makes sense. So for example, if someone opens to three big blinds and you three bet to 10 big blinds and they call the pot's now going to be around 20 big blinds and you're going to have 90 big blinds behind. So there's a four and a half to one stack to pot ratio. We're going to get into that a little bit versus at 50 big blinds when someone raises you call, you're going to kind of have about that same stack to pot ratio. Um, at 50 big blinds, small pocket pairs begin to lose value. As you can see, we're now folding hands like deuces, threes, and fours. Offsuit Broadway hands gain a lot of value. The Offsuit Broadway hands gain a lot of value, and any top pair in a three-bet pot can now stack off in these three-bet pots. So your three-bet range is more blocker oriented at 50 big blinds. We're going to get into that three betting adjustments now, but the key thing still to take away is the suitedness in the top grid at 150 big blinds versus more offsuit hands here playing at the 50 big blinds. So I want to talk a little bit now about adjustments in three betting based off stack sizes and again we're going to be talking about the types of hands that you want to be making these adjustments with so at 150 big blinds your three betting range kind of like your opening range is going to be very suited connector heavy and very wheel ace suited heavy so at 150 big blinds here at the top this is what a three bet range might look like uh, a polarized three betting range of jacks are better ace king and ace queen suited those are our value hands um, the more important thing to look at here here is our bluffs we're, we're bluffing with hands like six five suited seven six suited eight seven suited these suited one gappers like nine seven eight six and seven five suited ten nine suited and ace five and ace four suited um, this would be a very polar decent three betting strategy at 150 big blinds as you can see we're value three betting about 44 combos and bluffing with 36 combos here so we're fairly balanced in terms of the number of combos each and we have good board coverage so the problem with a lot of weaker players deep stacked at 150 big blinds is they three bet and call and they don't bluff enough and so let's say i'm playing against a player who i perceive to be weak and i open a middle position and then a player three bets the button and this player is pretty tight and I don't think has a three bet bluffing range. Um, I call, I'm gonna put them on this top red range like jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace, king, maybe ace, queen suited. Now the flop comes five, six, seven. I am just going to pound on him when the flop comes five, six, seven if I don't think he's ever bluffing because his range is jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace, king. He doesn't hit that board at all. And I'm gonna have all these middling pocket pairs and middling suited connectors that he doesn't have and it's gonna be really hard for him to play because I have so many two pairs straight sets and so this is kind of why you want to have a bluffing range to protect yourself in those spots and if you three bet a range like this on the button let's say against a middle position open now when the flop comes five six seven hey we can have two pair seven six we have all these pair and straight draws even if you three bet nine eight suited you're gonna have a straight um, ace five and ace four suited these are great for covering like the deuce three four four five all these flush boards the key thing i want to point out here also is i'm not saying three bet these exact hands you don't have to three bet nine seven suited you don't have to three bet ten nine suited like you can three bet it's more the type of hands you can three bet nine eight suited you can three bet five four six four seven four eight five suited nine six suited you want to be 
three betting these hands are going to play much better at a very deep stack depth that can make straights and flushes and give you some board coverage. Now at 50 big blinds, the range is going to change a lot in terms of where we draw our three bet blush from. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that players make playing short stack. Um, from Lewis, yeah, hands like ace queen off, ace jack suited, we would be just calling with on the button. This is just the hands that are going to be re raising with. Um, and from Stan, are ace two suited and ace three suited that much worse than ace four suited and ace five suited, or do they just add too many bluffs into our range? It's kind of a combination of both. Um, like I said before, in the types of hands, you can definitely three bet ace three and ace two suited, but you have that little added equity um, with the ace five and ace four suited when our opponent has deuces and threes. They are better hands. You're going to make slightly, you're going to make a, a pair of fives. You're going to have uh, dominated a little bit more when he has five six suited or five seven suited and the five comes on the flop. It's just, you know, a little bit stronger hand. You just don't want to, you can't be bluffing every combination. But um, it's just a combination of both. We don't want to be bluffing too much, and ace five suited is stronger than ace deuce and has some more equity um, when called. So at 50 big blinds, the bigger ace x suited hands are going to be part of our bluffing range and offsuit Broadway heavy range. So um, we're going to have a wider value range um, at 50 big blinds. So when we're three betting off of 50 big blinds, we need less of a, the value threshold is lower. So when you're three betting at 100 or 150 big blinds, you need a stronger hand to stack off because you're risking 150 big blinds. Um, when you three bet at 50 big blinds, you can stack off with a little bit less of a hand because you're only risking 50 big blinds. So you can have more hands for value, which also means you can have some more hands for bluffs. Um, so in this value range, we've added a hand like pocket tens, ace queen suited, ace jack suited, ace queen off, king queen suited, kind of under our value range. And our bluffs have changed drastically. We no longer are three bet bluffing these smaller suited connectors. Our three bet bluffing range has gotten stronger in terms of now we're three betting these ace nine, ace eight, ace five suited. And then this region here, the ace jack, king jack, ace 10 off and king 10 off. And the reason... Why do we want to start now three betting these ace jacks, king tens, ace ten, king jack off? Um, there's a couple of reasons. First, our three betting range now, we're more concerned about blockers to their four bet shoving range. So when we three bet their range, they're going to call sometimes, but this is starting to get that stacked up where they can just move all in over our three bet. And so we really want to make sure that we're blocking their shoving range. So Hands like tens, jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack. These are the types of hands that they might four bet shove with over our three bet. So with hands like ace, jack, ace, ten, king, ten, king, jack, we're blocking those hands. So it's less likely that we get shoved on and more likely we get to see a flop. And when we do see a flop with these hands, we're going to flop good, strong top pairs on ace and king high boards where our decisions are going to be really easy post flop. Now, one of the questions I poise here is like, why would we three bet a hand like king 10 offsuit, but not three bet king queen offsuit? And I think this is kind of an important concept that I threw in here that I think a lot of people, even really good players, don't get. Um, when you're three betting, there's a couple, you're either bluffing or you're three betting for value. So your bluffs, you know, you're going to have some equity in the hand. Um, but the main thing you want to happen when you three bet a bluff is them to fold a hand that's better than yours. So when we three bet a hand like king 10 off, if we get king queen offsuit or king jack offsuit, which are going to be opening in middle position, say middle position opens and we three bet on the button with king 10 offsuit, there's a lot of people that are going to fold king jack offsuit for sure and maybe even king queen offsuit. And now we've just folded out a hand that's 70%, you know, with uh, versus our hand. So we have a much better, we just got them to fold 70% equity, which is a huge win for us. Same with ace 10 offsuit, we can get ace jack to fold. King jack, we can get king queen to fold. You want to be three betting a hand. So if we three bet king queen, ace queen or ace king are never going to fold. And hands like king 10 offsuit and king jack offsuit are going to fold. 
So with king queen, not many better hands are gonna fold. Ace king and ace queen in particular. The only hands that are gonna fold are maybe like pocket low pocket pairs or suited connectors. And king jack and king ten, these hands that we dominate now fold. So we'd rather just flat with a hand like king queen and let king jack and king ten stay in the pot. Hopefully we can flop a king, dominate them, and now we might have a good chance of doubling up at 50 big blinds versus if we three bet king queen, they fold king jack, we just lost a really good situation for us. Again, it's not important to remember these exact ranges. These are more examples of types of hands that you want to be three betting. You want to focus on categories of hands that, so offsuit broadways at 50 big blinds, wheel suited aces and middle east, uh, the wheel suited aces at 150 big blind, like ace five and ace four suited are very good to three betting. And then when you get down to 50, we're no longer, we want to be three betting more like ace nine suited, ace eight suited type hands rather than being too wheel suited heavy. So someone asked with ace five suited on the other end, I am blocking one five and someone else could be have five, six suited. So yes, you could be folding out a hand like five, six suited, but the really good thing about ace five suited is now hands like ace 10 offsuit, ace nine offsuit, ace jack offsuit. You get a lot of better aces to fold. Even possibly a hand like pocket sixes might throw up to your three bet. So, Um, someone asked with ace nine suited, if we get a pair on an ace in a three bet pot versus early position, are we okay stacking off with it? No. Again, these ranges I was talking about from the first example, these are more like middle position versus early position. And these examples, while we might not be stacking off, we can at least get one or two streets of value. The hand becomes much easier to play when we have top pair. So at 50 big blinds here with the ace nine suited, yeah, we're going to, if we get a lot of resistance, we'll be more cautious. But the hand's going to play much easier at 50 big blinds than at 150 big blinds. So keep in mind types of hands that we're going to be three betting at 50, types of hands that we're going to be three betting at 150, um, and then the, the main thing being these suited connectors, suited wheel aces at 150, and then a lot of these offsuit broadways. Also at um, 150, I didn't mark them in this example. But again, we're talking about types of hands. Good types of hands to three bet would be a hand like king nine suited, jack nine suited, um, 10 nine suited is always a really good hand to three bet. And those have the properties of if we three bet a hand like king nine suited, we're getting hands like king 10 off, king jack off to fold, uh, ace nine off to fold. And we still have pretty good playability and we can make good top pairs with king nine, queen nine, jack nine. These suited nines and suited eights this section of the grid become also decent three bets at a 50 big blind stack. So Matthew asked a decent question. Should we do doing more value three betting with smaller stacks with ace queen and ace jack? And the answer is yes. Those hands become more value oriented the shorter your stack, especially the suited. So ace queen suited, ace jack suited, I think are very good value three bets at 50 big blinds. Um, players are going to call your three bet and then you're going to flop top pairs that you dominate, um, especially because most players are going to jam with their ace king preflop. So ace queen becomes a very good value three bet at 50 big blinds because you know if they flat call, now they never have ace king. So three betting ace queen at 50 big blinds is really good because you make them play their range face up because they're almost always going to just jam with ace king. And so ace high boards now are so easy to play with ace queen. You have the nuts versus at 150 big blinds. If you three bet ace queen offsuit at 150, they might just call with ace king. So now you still have to be kind of cautious on the ace high board. So these ace queen and ace jack type hands become better three bets at 50 big blinds than 150 because ace king is mostly going to be jamming against your three bet. And so you kind of clear up your outs. Uh, Stan asks, in our 50 big blind stack range, are we calling off to a four bet with all these hands in red, or are we folding the weaker ones like king, queen off, ace, jack suit, or even ace, queen off? Um, yes. Yeah, so against most players, especially if you're playing a small stakes tournament, like let's say you're playing a $300 buy-in tournament and you have 50 big blinds, the caliber of play is not going to be as high. And I would always three bet this red range. And then I would fold ace, queen, 
off ace queen suited ace jack suited to the four bet jam and the king queen suited because players are going to play very face up once you three bet them they're going to just four bet with their really good hands but majority of people are just going to call way too much and you're just getting a lot of value with your ace queen and ace jack if you're playing against really tough opponents who are in a four bet jam hands like ace five suited or pocket fives um more aggressive opponents then maybe you can just call with some of those hands or you can start three bet calling those hands as well but it kind of depends on your opponent there so let's keep going on this i'm going to get to some of these questions later um stack to pot ratio you've heard me talk about this the first couple of times um, I want to go over it. Some people may have not heard the term before or not familiar with it. Um, ties back into everything. Hand playability is driven by SPR, which is what we refer to for stack to pot ratio. So SPR is driven by how stacks deep are. So two examples. We're playing 150 big blinds. There's a 3x open from early position. The button calls. The pot is now eight and a half big blinds. So three big blinds plus three big blinds from the two calls, one and a half big blinds from the ant, uh, the small blind and big blind, and one big blind from the ante. So it's eight and a half big blinds. Now the effective stacks are 147 big blinds after the raise. So the SPR is 147 divided by 8.5, which is 17 is a 17 SPR. So you have 17 times the pot left in the stacks left to be played. In the other example, at 50 big blinds, we opened a two and a half X, the button calls, the pot is now seven and a half big blinds. So two and a half and two and a half, that's five plus one and a half from the uh, two blinds and then a one ante. So it's seven and a half big blinds. The stack is 47 and a half big blinds now. So your SPR is just over six, six and one third SPR. So there's a big difference in the stacks left to play. And this is what kind of drives this hand playability and why we choose certain hands to play in our ranges versus others. So these are not hard and fast rules, but just kind of a general rule of thumb. So when you get an SPR of less than five, your really good top pairs become strong enough to stack off. So for example, we're playing 40 big blinds deep. We raise king queen offsuit in middle position and the button calls the pot seven and a half big blinds. There's 37 and a half big blinds left to play. Our SPR is five. The flop comes queen eight four. And we know the SPR is five. And we flopped a really strong top pair now. We're probably starting to plan our strategy by to try to get the money in here by the river. We've got five big blinds on the flop. Our opponent calls. The pot is now 17 and a half big blinds. Stacks are 32. So now the SPR is about two now on the turn. The turn is the seven of diamonds, brings a flush draw, five, six gets there. We bet 12 and a half big blinds into 17 and a half and our opponent calls. So now the pot is 42 big blinds and the stacks are 20 big blinds. So now the stack to pot ratio on the river is 0.5. There's only 20 big blinds left in the stack and 42 big blinds in the stock. The pot, the river's the nine of hearts with such a short stack to pot ratio with only 20 big blinds. We shove for half pot our opponent. And this is a key point with the SPR. If we're playing only 40 big blinds deep. Our opponent is likely to have three bet or raise a hand like ace queen or better by the turn due to the shallow stacks. So king queen becomes much stronger hand at this SPR because how ace queen would have played. Uh, when we're this shallow, ace queen likely could have just shoved the turn or raised the flop. At this point same with sets of eights or any two weird two pair combos on the flop or eight seven on the turn when the stacks are so shallow they're just incentivized to get the money in now before a bad card comes off or before before the board comes too scary so you know i would think in a lot of spots like this ace queen would have tried to get the money in before the river and so king queen becomes a much stronger hand versus in our next example what we're going to look at um it's just the the key point here it's very easy to get stacks in at a sub five spr without big betting we bet 
two thirds pot, two thirds pot, and we were only left with a half pot bet on the river. So we could even bet half pot, half pot, and probably shove the river for like two thirds pot. So when you're less than five SPR, it's just so easy to get the money in um, when you want to. Let's look at the opposite example. When you have an SPR greater than five, you need to be a little more cautious with top pair hands. So same example, but we're 100 big blinds deep. We raise with king queen off in the middle position and the button calls. Pot seven and a half. The stacks are 97 and a half and the SPR is 13. The flop comes queen eight four rainbow. We bet five our opponent calls. So the pot 17 and a half stacks are 98 and a half. So now the stack to pot ratio is a little over five on the flop. It turns to seven of diamonds, same turn. We bet 12 and a half and our opponent calls. So now going into the river, we still have a two SPR with 86 big blinds left and 42 in the pot versus on the last example, we had half. So the SPR is four times as big in this example as the last one. Uh, with the river, the nine of hearts, um, with an SPR two here, we cannot get stacks in without over betting at some point. Um, and the key point here is at this stack depth, our opponent may not have raised ace queen offsuit preflop. They may have just called. And the flop or turn with deeper stacks, they might have also just called. They might have used the same logic. I only have one pair here. I'm just going to call. I don't want to get 100 big blinds in yet with this hand. Um, he also might have called two bets with a hand like jack 10 suited or 10 9 suited. Um, Specifically, Jack-10 suited, making a straight here. It's conceivable, like, he'd have Jack-10 of diamonds where he called the flop with a gut shot, turned a straight draw, now he has the nuts. Um, at the shallower stack depths, Jack-10 is suited, might shove, will probably still shove the turn. So it's more likely there's a lot more hands that could be beating us. We could have gotten floated lighter. There's more two-pair combos. So... Villain's range becomes stronger here because he is less likely to stack off on the turn with ace-queen um, versus in the previous example, ace-queen is a pretty easy, he could just shove the turn with ace-queen um, at the 50 big blind example. Now when we're at 100 big blinds, ace-queen's a really heavy chunk of his range here um, when we get to the river. So key, key point here, hand values increase at shallower SPRs, even weak top pairs are stronger at shallower SPRs and hand values decrease at deeper SPRs, So it needs stronger hands to stack off. So kind of the same concepts we've been talking about um, the whole webinar. Uh, just looking through the question. So Matthew asked, what about, you know, queen nine, which would have rivered two pair or jack 10, which would have rivered a straight. Um, I think queen nine is probably not calling preflop at the 50 big blind example. And it's more likely a hand like queen nine could have called at the hundred big blind example. Same with Jack 10, um, Jack 10 offsuit. Maybe it calls at hundred big blinds versus at 50, it probably folds. So I just think the, uh, ranges are easier to pinpoint ranges at the shallower stacks versus at deeper stacks. Ranges are wider. There's more combinations of random two pairs that can be made, more combinations of floats. Um, you're less likely to get floated at a shallow stack depth and a shallow SPR than you are at a very heavy SPR, greater than five. Like you can float a lot more because you have more implied odds. You have more maneuverability on later streets. Um, like for example, let's say we floated this flop at the... So in this less than five SPR, let's say we're the button and we have ace deuce of diamonds and the button bets five big blinds. We call with our backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. Now the turn is the seven of diamonds and he bets two thirds pot. Like we're barely getting the right price to call with our flush draw and over. Like we're getting the right price, but it's not that great of a situation because if we don't hit we, we have very little way to win the pot. He's just going to shove the river. We likely won't get a chance to bluff on the river. Versus at 100 big blinds at, with the SPR greater than five, I'm more happy to float with a hand like ace, deuce of diamonds here because there's another 86 big blinds behind on the turn when we call, when we hit this backdoor flush draw. And we can now we can represent that hand like jack 10 on the, the, the river. We can represent 
five, six more. We can represent uh, a nine, eight that peeled and got sticky on the turn. So there's just more ways to represent um, at the deeper stack sizes. Um, we're getting a lot of questions coming in right now. So what we're gonna do that's what I got for the slides. We're going to kind of go back and review some of these slides and the questions as I go through the questions. But I just want to remind everyone that you can try PokerCoaching.com free for seven days right now. Um, there's over 400 interactive quizzes. I'm making quizzes every month. My quizzes are released every week. Um, I, these quizzes are a great way to warm up for your sessions. Um, I have an article that will be coming out on Poker Coaching about warming up for your sessions and one of the ways i like to warm up is reviewing hands and doing these interactive quizzes it gets your brain flowing it gets your brain thinking in the poker way these quizzes are a great great way to get one-on-one -on -one coaching for a fraction of the cost i get to walk you through exactly my thought processes thought processes in each hand um, also there's the homework section um, jonathan provides a situation for your homework and he personally reviews the answers it's a great way to, the homework questions are great because they're very um, all inclusive. You have to think outside the box and you think about many different variables and there's no one right or wrong answer. It's more your thought process behind it and your strategy. And that's a great way to get, you know, personally get your homework reviewed by Jonathan in his webinar. You have all these, uh, you know, coaching webinars on there. Between that, the quizzes, and the homework, there's a ton of uh, ways to work and improve on your game. I think many players, even professionals, don't work on their game enough. I spent, I mean, this week alone, I've probably spent eight hours away from the table doing different things, working on my game. Um, a lot of players get very complacent in their poker game and don't work on their game enough. And these poker training sites, PokerCoaching.com, they're great ways to get coaching from top professionals at a fraction of the cost. So look at starting the seven-day free trial. Um, I'm happy to be coaching there now. You'll continue to see my quizzes on there. You'll continue to get webinars and uh, articles. There's just a lot of value to be had um, at the price point. And think about it this way. If you're a 200, like let's say you play one, two, no limit live. If you're playing, you know, paying for poker coaching at $30 a month, it doesn't take very long to make that money back. Like if you improve your win rate by $5 an hour, which isn't hard to do at all, you're, I guarantee like almost you can increase your win rate by $5 an hour. It doesn't take much time at all to recoup the, the costs and you're going to make a lot more money. It's a great investment. Um, so now I'm going to spend quite a bit of time. We're going to go through all these questions. Um, I see them in the chat. Go ahead and keep asking questions, and I will go through the next questions for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, Lewis says one session I paid. He played one session that paid for three years of PokerCoaching.com. That's great, Lewis. Um, is there any way we can get a copy of their slides? Uh, this will be reposted on YouTube, so you can rewatch the video on YouTube, but actual releasing of the slides, I don't think that will happen possibly, but we can ask Jonathan about that. Darren says, congratulations on the chopping at the win. Um, he says, can I, you please tell me as how or why I chopped? Um, basically just, there's a ton of variance in heads up and I didn't feel like playing a heads up match for $20,000. The other guy was a professional. And so chopping was just kind of a way to lock up the money and reduce a lot of variance. Um, my quizzes are tough, Stan says. So Eric Anderson asks, how many big blinds would you stack off with second nuts, third nuts? These are all relative questions and they can't really be answered. When I talk about, you know, at an SPR less than five, good top pairs become easy to stack off. You're just much more comfortable playing a big pot versus 
when you have 150 big blinds and you have one pair, you know you're not supposed to be playing a 300 big blind pot. But as you see in the example that I provided at the uh, for the SPR, it's just very easy to get the money in when you want, when you have less than a five SPR and shallower stacks versus deeper stacks, it's hard to get the money in. So, this is a good question by Ricardo. So, in the middle stages of a tournament, if I have a 100 big blind stack and I'm the chip leader versus second place is 45 big blinds, I need to use the effective stacks 50 big blind hand raised advice. Yes. So, your stack size doesn't matter. It's the effective stacks of the opponents. So, in your case, if you have 100 big blinds and everyone else at the table has 50 big blinds, you should be playing your stacks. Your hand selection should be like a 50 big blind stack because that's the effective stacks that you're playing. It doesn't matter how many chips you have. It's how many chips you effectively have. So Richard Gutierrez, similar questions. Are you discussing these strategies? It doesn't matter if the opponent has a much smaller stack size. Yes, you're basing these strategies off of the effective stack size, not your stack size. So if you have 80 big blinds and someone has 40 big blinds, you should be playing it like you have 40 big blinds. Uh, Trent asks, is this your default strategy or are we assuming a loose opening range? So for middle position, my default strategy is going to be opening around 25% of hands. Um, I make a lot of adjustments to that. Um, a key point is when you're developing your strategies, you should always have kind of a baseline strategy, a default strategy, you might call it, and then always be making adjustments versus the opponents that you're playing. Are they playing too loose? Are they playing so too tight? So I'm going to have my default three betting ranges that I have. Um, and then... I'm going to make adjustments if the guy's opening too tight. I'm going to three bet less. If he's opening too loose, I might three bet more. So to answer your question, Trent, it, you, you want to base it off your default strategies. And again, it's not the ex specific examples of hands that I said. Like you don't have to three bet exactly king 10 offsuit. You know, you could three bet, you know, king nine, queen nine. It's just have a general reason of why you're doing something and know the type of hands that you should be three betting at those points. So Matthew points out, I worry with ace two suited if I get the wheel that some with someone else having seven suited since I'm not blocking any of those combos. Yes, that's another reason why ace five suited is gonna be a stronger hand than ace deuce and ace three suited because ace five, you're gonna make um there's gonna be less you're gonna you're gonna make five six suited can dominate you but it's less likely now you have a blocker to that five six suited so if it comes three four five and you have ace two suited you have no blockers to six seven suited so it's a little more likely someone could have that versus if you have ace five suited um you have now the only hand that beats you is five six suited and you have a blocker to that so it's less likely that someone has it so We covered effective stacks. So David asks, what are your bet sizes when you three bet at each stack level? So the deeper the stacks, the larger my bet sizes are going to be. And the shallower the stacks, the smaller my bet sizes are going to be, David. So if you looked at when I showed the example of if you go back and review the slide where I have less than a five SPR, how easy it was for me to get the money in. I bet two thirds, two thirds, and then a half pot on the river in that point. But I easily could have bet something like one third pot on the flop, half pot on the turn, and then shove for two thirds pot on the river. Um, it's just very easy to get the money in. And so your stack sizes versus when you're playing 150 big blinds to get the money in by the river. If you want to, you probably have to be betting pot, 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 or even, you know, pot on the flop, a little over pot on the turn and then shoving for pot or over pot on the river. Um, Jeff Friedman at 150 big blinds deep, two people limp in early position. I have pocket fours. Do I raise or limp along? Um, I really like 
just kind of limping along with pocket fours. I think players isolate way too much over limpers. Um, with fours, you don't block any of their calling range, so they can still have all the, you know, king, queens, ace, jacks. Um, and your hand, it plays very hot or cold. There's a lot of flops you just hate. And so, you know, five or six times out of, you know, 70, 80% of the time, the flop's not going to be favorable for you with two fours, so you can just fold them. And then now when you do flop a set or one of those, like, deuce, three, five flops, you have a cheap investment and you can win a pot. Chris Morgan, I watched a video from Jonathan Little saying I almost never chop. I actually normally don't chop, and I think this is the first time I chopped a live tournament. But the player was very good, and your edges playing heads up are pretty small. And it kind of depends on bank rolls and uh, your kind of appetite for variance. And just it was kind of in the moment, I just didn't feel like playing a huge heads up match. And so. Um, rather than play a 17k heads up match like if i was just walking in the casino and someone was like hey do you want to play heads up for seventeen thousand dollars i would be like no i don't want to play heads up for seventeen thousand dollars it's too much money so i was kind of thinking what's the difference at this point so we had it and just did a chip chop doug can this be applied to cash games at all or would you just reload before hitting 50 big blinds that's personal preference for myself. I'd always reload. So for like example, in an online cash game with a hundred big blinds, I have the setting where it will auto top me off to a hundred big blinds because I'm very comfortable playing and want to have everyone covered. Um, but if you don't, you say you buy into cash games for 50 big blinds. This is the, this strategy would apply the same, um, at 50 big blinds. Still, you're going to want to just have these hands that can make better top pairs and suited connectors in your small pairs are going to be less valuable. So yes, the strategy would be the same, whether it's cash games or tournaments, it's the same principles and fundamentals, just a different format. Should uh, Nick Reynolds, should small pocket pairs be considered if you're closing the action multi-way pots with 50 big blinds? Yes. So like in the big blind or closing the action, I'm almost always going to call with these small pairs. But let's say you're in early position. And so let's, let's say early position raises to three big blinds, Nick, and you are like second to act. I don't want to call with pocket fours because we still have five or six people left behind us and they all could three bet or squeeze and we're not going to be able, we're not deep enough to call the, that raise. So it makes a lot more sense. You want to be folding even up to maybe like pocket sixes because of the stack depth and how many people are left to act. But when you're in the big blind, of course, you always want to flick in those extra one or two big blinds. You're getting well the, uh, you know, correct pot odds to try to hit your set. So, Jonathan State, how do you adjust raising ranges with a 50 or 100 big blind stack when there are multiple players to your left with a 20 to 25 big blind rejam range? This is a great question. This is a whole other topic that we could have gotten into, but in terms of time constraints. So, if you have 100 big blinds or 50 big blinds and there's a bunch of 20 to 25 big blind stacks and they keep going all in over your raises, you need to start to tighten up. Um, it's very easy for them to just start going all in over your raises, but the same concepts still apply. I'd rather raise a hand like King Jack offsuit because now I'm blocking the types of hands they could rejam with, um, versus a hand that like, even a hand like Ace Four offsuit becomes a little more valuable because having the Ace in your hand blocks a lot of their rejamming range, like their suited Aces, etc. So, again, when the shorter stacks blockers become more relevant to rejamming ranges. Uh, versus the playability is not as important on the shorter stacks. Ben O'Richter, can I use the 100 big blind strategy also in cash games? Yes. The ranges I kind of gave in there were with antis included, which cash games don't have antis, so you'd have to make adjustments for that. But the same principles apply. KP, does 3-bet size increase with bigger stack sizes? Yes, um, the deeper the stacks, the larger your three bet should be, the shallower the three bet stack size, the smaller your three bet should be. So on 50 big blinds in position, my three bet's probably going to be around 2.7 to 3.8 times the open. Out of position, my three bet's probably going to be about three and a half times, maybe up to four times the open. 
Uh, 150 big blinds in position. My smallest three bet size would be like three and a half big times the open. And then out of position, I'm probably making it four to four and a half times the open. So Matthew asks, is it a good idea to raise wide to bully opponents in the case you described when your stack is much larger than that of anyone else in your table? Only if it's like an ICM spot where there's a big money jumps and people have to tighten up. But I think a lot of mistakes people make is they get a big chip lead or they have everyone covered and they just start like, well, I got to be the you know alpha male and try to win every pot. No, you still want to keep your fundamentals. You still want to you know adjust your sizes. I mean, adjust your ranges to the proper hands. Um, but just raising to try to bully, unless they're being overly tight, um, you should just be playing good fundamental poker. You want to kind of protect your chips. Thank you, Richard Gutierrez. Thank you very much. Your session was like drinking water from a fire hydrant. Lots to consider and learn. Scott uh, Seaman, is PokerCoaching.com geared to both cash or tournament players or both? Uh, both. If you watch my quizzes on PokerCoaching.com are both live, like everything. I post live cash game hands. I post live tournament hands. I post online cash game hands, and I post online tournament hands. So I kind of play all four variants. Um, the hands I, the quizzes I post are actual hands that I play. I'm not really, I'm not creative enough to make up hands. Um, so... <laughs> So these are like real life hands that I'm playing and they're both cash and tournament live and online. Uh, Thomas, I kind of understand your question. If you play effective stack of 40 big blinds, how, how can you put a pressure on them when you have double the stack of everyone? Again, if you have 40 big blinds and everyone else has 20, it's like you're playing a 20 big blind effective stack. And when you're playing 20 big blinds, you need to tighten up. So just because you have 40, unless they're playing overly tight against you, you need to kind of tighten up because everyone else only has 20 big blinds effective. At what stack size do you stop shoving King King pre Lewis asked. Um, the deeper the stacks are, say like 150, 200 big blinds, um, it becomes quite common to just be flatting three bets with Kings. Um, the main reason being that the only hand at like 150 big blinds that you want to stack off with really is aces. And depending on how you want to construct your four betting range, if you want to start four betting a lot, like at 200 big blinds, like even at 150 big blinds, I'm comfortable. Get, I had a hand in LAPC actually last week where I, had, I stacked off Kings preflop for like 180 big blinds. But it depends on a lot of players. This, this is kind of exploitative. Most players don't four bet wide enough. And so when they do four bet, it's really just aces and like queens and it's never a bluff. So when people start four bet bluffing preflop, you have to stack off with ace king. But against these people that never four bet or five bet bluff, like that's when you should stop shoveling money in with kings. Not necessarily your stack size, Lewis. It's more, does my opponent ever four bet bluff or five bet bluff? Or is it only just aces? Is M ratio, Darren asks, is M ratio like your stack to blind ratio? Um, a little bit. SPR is kind of like that, but M is more your stack compared to the blinds and annies versus SPR is your stack compared to the size of the pot. SP, uh, Stan asks, SPRs in multi-way pots, especially on turn and river situations, can get complex. How do you navigate them? The same way as a heads up pot, just the SPR is always going to be lower in a multi-way pot. So you're again, like kind of the, with a lower SPR, your good, strong top pairs become much stronger multi-way pots. Um, the SPR, it's just easier to get the money in when you want to. And so you're just playing in a lower SPR pot um, in a multi-way pot. Jeff Friedman at 100 big, big blind stack. What are you opening to under the gun? Um, 
I've been inducing a, using a strategy lately that's kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of people think. I actually like min raise or raise really small in early position, and I raise much larger in late position. So in early position, I might be making it like min raise. I might just min raise it, and then on the button, I might make it like almost like I'll be raising to 3x on the button. And the reason is, is when I open under the gun, I'm almost for sure going to be playing the pot out of position at a very deep stack and a deep SPR. So I don't want to bloat this pot where I'm going to have a hard time playing out of position um, at very deep stacks. So I want to keep this pot small by only min raising. So versus a lot of people like to three or four X under the gun. And then a lot of players like to min raise the button, but I like to three X the button or even four X it early on in the tournament. Cause now I'm playing a pot in position and I'm much more comfortable playing a big pot in position. So it's counterintuitive, but I think it's more correct that I'll raise bigger from the button in the cutoff and smaller in early position. Excuse me. Uh, Gary Blow, do we three bet bluff for any buy in level online? Not necessarily true. This is a balanced approach. Um, this is kind of your baseline. You want to be adjusting this baseline strategy versus your opponent. If your opponent never folds a three bet and it's going to call your three bet with five, three suited or like eight, four suited and stuff, you can just stop three betting, uh, your bluffs and just three bet wider for value. Um, always be making adjustments to your opponents. So against a lot of opponents online in $1 tournaments, you don't need to have a three bet bluffing range. You can have just a very, very wide three bet value range. What about Robert Roberto asks, what about live cash with 200 big blinds? Same theory, same concepts. You want to be playing hands that can make flushes and straights, not top pair. Um, a few more questions here before we wrap it up. Matthew Rebo, at what stack sizes should one either push or fold? I typically start doing 15 big blinds or left. Yes, 15 big blinds is the spot where I will start doing it. I still do a lot of min raising off of 15 big blinds, but there's certain hands that I will start jamming. More than 15, I really don't do any jamming at all because I think I have a post-flop edge and I want to be playing more hands. Jeff Friedman, so at 100 big blinds deep, under the gun opens to three big blinds, three people call. I have pocket queens. How many big blinds are you raising to your three bet? Uh, at least 15, probably. Um, so there's an open, there's 12 big blinds in the pot. So I think you can even make it up to like 16 to 18 big blinds. Somewhere in the range of 15 to 18 seems good. Jonathan Little asks, can you briefly discuss how to play with 100 or 250 big blind stacks when people use huge raises to 10 big blinds preflop, like is often the case in small stakes games? So your strategy, I'm going to just be doing a lot of flat calling. When someone opens to 10 big blinds, playing 100 or 250 big blinds. Um, and the main reason is, like, I don't have a lot of incentive to be three betting a hand like pocket queens when someone through opens to 10 big blinds because they're already isolating the, the spot. A lot of the reasons you want to be three betting is to get the pot heads up. So let's say middle position opens to 10 big blinds and we're on the button with, say, pocket jacks or pocket queens. Our hand normally be good enough like if they opened to three big blinds we would three bet to 10 big blinds but he's already three opened it to 10 big blinds so we can just call now and play this pot in position without three betting because they've already made the raise big enough where we're not worried about the blinds coming in we want to play this pot heads up and that's already going to happen so you can actually almost not have a three betting range and just flat with everything including aces unless it's a complete lunatic if you three bet and he's just going to shovel it all in with queens or jacks, then sure, three bet aces, but you don't have to, I would just do a lot of calling and I would fold like, I would call really tight to the 10 big blind open. So like I might even fold sixes and fives and fours um, and like six, seven suited and just call with my really good hands basically. Uh, Ricardo. Ask the hand with he has pocket sevens. There's 150 big blind open in the middle position. The player in 
with 85 big blinds called. I have 100 big blinds on the dealer button with 77, but the blinds have around 30 to 50, 40, 30 to 40 big blinds. Should I call, fold, or raise? Um, I would always just call here. 30 to 40 big blinds from the blinds. It's gonna be they're gonna have to pick up a really good hand to squeeze. If most players don't squeeze wide enough, so I wouldn't be worried about not seeing a flop there. Uh, Lewis, what is your calling range when you have 100 big blinds versus 20 big blind shoves? Um, pretty much the exact same. If I had 40 big blinds versus a 20 big blind shove, um, I'm calling pretty much the same range. Maybe a, just a tiny bit tighter when I have 40 big blinds versus 100, just because of what risk I'm taking. Um, Tom, will there be a replay? I was at work and missed most of this. Yes, you can find the replay of this on YouTube. Um, okay, James said, at uh, Jeff Friedman asks, at 50 big blinds deep, I am chip leader of the table at my tourney. Under the gun guy, James, 10 big blinds. I have pocket sixes in middle position. Are you shoving, folding, or calling? Uh, I would fold here because we are in middle position and still have five players left to act. If we were in the big blind or maybe the small blind, I would call with the pocket sixes. We're ahead of his jamming range, but we want to be closing the action here. Tom Bacon, do you adjust your three bet range if there's a cold call between you and the opener? Yes. Um, we have to adjust our range now because there's someone that put money in that likely has a really good hand. Um, just getting through these last questions. Have one more minute here. Uh, Ricardo asks about this new single big blind ante and just kind of the adjustments. What advice and analysis? People over adjust their strategies. Um, the strategy really doesn't change it much at all with the single big blind ante. It just makes everything go quicker. All right. Call. We're going to get to that. KP, when will be your next webinar? I will have one at the end of the month. I think the 27th, um, somewhere around there. Um, you'll see a post about it. Christopher, what is the best way to start on poker coaching for plugging leaks and learning the quizzes, homework, training courses, videos? The quizzes are a good, you know, quick way when you only have 20, 30 minutes to get some work in. But the homework, I think, is a really good way to really get some in-depth thinking. Um, but just everything on there, you should be spending, you can spend a lot of time on there. So, Jim, aren't you concerned of getting multiple callers when you min-raise early with your big pairs or ace-king or ace-queen? Not in particular, because I think when I when we're you're playing 150 big blinds deep in level two of a tournament, if I raise to three times the big blind or two times the big blind, they're going to call anyways. You're going to be playing a multi-way pot with your big pairs or ace-king or ace-queen versus you're going to be like – they're not folding your 6-7 suited most players to your 3x or your 2x. It doesn't really matter to them like a lot of people just think about the value there they don't make the proper adjustments for race sizes so i'm just trying to minimize my disadvantage in terms of the size of the pot playing out of position um trent walker do you have any private coaching open i i Potentially, I'm going to be reopening private coaching. I'm not sure yet. I have it yet this year. Um, you can check out mattafflick.com. Um, and it has an email address, contact there. But um, Trent, yeah, go to mattafflick.com and you can uh, send an email there. And I haven't made a decision yet. I've just been really busy and playing a ton. But are you like this webinar? More like this on the coach poker coaching site? Yes, there's going to be monthly webinars um and if you like this type of content you're going to love the quizzes and the homework um there's a lot of good ways to improve your your game and uh in the future there might be webinars only to paid members jonathan's making some adjustments to that but all right guys that's a wrap we're at about an hour um thanks for everyone thanks for the questions and um i'll see you guys um 
I think the end of the month is my next webinar, but my content will be going up all month. So awesome guys. Thank you.